Aloha, everybody. I want to welcome you to this is our 17th episode of the Arizona History Happy Hour. And thank you all so much for being here. And tonight it's going to be a really special show because not only is it, as you can tell by my blue screen, why it's Shark Week, why it's also we are doing Wild West Tiki. Arizona and Tiki history. Who knew about the intersection, the collision of those two things? And we've got an amazing show for you tonight. I mean, besides the cocktail, Sharknado, we'll be talking about a little town in Arizona that has a little Tiki history, or well, actually about 14 feet of Tiki history, um, Antares. We also have Mike Skinner on talking about our Wild West Tiki history. We're going to be able to have a show and tell from Hidden Harbor an early Polynesian club right here in Arizona, as well as Tucson's own gem, Ernie Menahuna. So let's get ready for some show. So again, I want to welcome you all for being here as we are now here on the 17th week that we've been doing this. It really kind of came out of a love of wanting to share stories and hear and connect with people and figured, you know, let's just start something weekly so that we can make that happen. So we have Antares coming up. We have Sharknado. We have Ernie Menahuna. We've got an amazing show for you tonight. So you'll want to stick around for the entire thing. Now, this is only made possible because of you. Because you're sitting there watching, as well as all those of you that have donated, no matter how much anything helps. As well as there is sponsorship from AARP right here in Arizona, and they say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. AARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. If you'd like to find out about some of their online resources, some of their virtual programming they are doing, you can take a look at aarp.org slash az for events they are doing. And also I'll ask if you're watching on Facebook, if you can just click that share button so that way you let all your friends know how much fun and how tiki-tastic this one is going to be. And also as we go through, um, there is the chat session off to the side. Now, you also have the ability to reach out on Facebook, Marshall Hip Historian. You can also follow me on Instagram, Hip Historian, or email. And, you know, oh, and I see we've got a few people who are watching on Twitch. So, very good. So, basically, this is live streamed via Facebook Live, Twitch, and YouTube. It's also archived on YouTube. So, if you want to go back and watch prior episodes, you can easily do that from your own living room. So my name is Marshall Shore. I am your host of the Arizona History Happy Hour. Now, how did I get the name? The Hip Historian. Well, you know, about 20 years ago, I was working in a library in Brooklyn, and it was the middle of winter, and I was ready for a change. So we loaded up everything we own into a big orange cube, Oh, and actually, that's the library I used to work in back in Brooklyn. The last library I was working in, it was a great little Carnegie building. Ah, such a fun, beautiful place to work in. And so we loaded up everything into a U-Haul and made an adventure coming west. And when we landed in Phoenix, we wound up in a beautiful 1956 ranch house. Now, when we bought it, it was beige on beige on beige. And now it is a lovely two-tone sea foam and cantaloupe. And the reason why we bought the house was because it's pretty much a time capsule. That's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the matching push buttons inset for the stovetop, and that 1956 GE electric oven. 
Now, as soon as I got here from New York, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went for an adventure, I came face to face with so many amazing stories. And then there was that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love. And all those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed on the way to somewhere else, well, after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, and in some cases looking for a house just like mine. And then there's this man, Dr. Carrier. He invented a little thing called air conditioning. Now, without him, we would not be having quite so much here in the summer in Arizona. Why, here we can relax and even throw our hands up in celebration because of that little invention. Also, the Phoenix New Times has named me Best Historian several years running, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me the Best Spectacular Phoenix Celebrity because I do indeed like my eyewear. Now, what is Marshall wearing? You know, I could be wearing a variety of things. You know, not long ago, before all this happened, I went to a Bollywood party at the art museum. And so I wore a caftan and I fit right in. But tonight I am wearing my Arizona jacket. This was a picture that was taken at a photo shoot at Mel's Diner. Yes, it is that Mel's Diner from Alice. And so that jacket was created back in 2012 for Centennial. Now you remember every year on February 14th, we have a celebration for Arizona. And back in 2012, it was 100 years of statehood. So we did things across the state, including right in front of our very own capital. They had a stage with all kinds of performers running throughout the day. And they let me be on that stage for 15 minutes talking about anything I wanted to. And I chose one of the most favorite events that was started back in 1926 by Charlotte Hall. She was a poet and wound up in Prescott. And if you go there today, you can go visit her house, which is now a museum, as well as a home to prior territorial governors. Now, the event she started was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It was based on a legend about how the God of Sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. So it was always a springtime event. Now, originally it was held just down from the state capitol at the old Shriners Temple. And it then became the Mine and Mineral Museum. But they got kicked out for an event that didn't happen. But I'm happy to say they're going to be moving back in. The sooner, the better. It then moved here to Montgomery Stadium, which was the first stadium right here in Arizona. And they did a variety of events, including the Salad Bowl, playing up on the agricultural history of Arizona. It was run by the Kiwanis Club as a way to raise funds for their charities. And they would just pack them in for the Salad Bowl, as well as... They would have a parade, and what would you expect from the salad bowl? Why, none other than the queen of the salad bowl arriving on her float in a salad bowl with a spoon and fork to serve with. And so those two events were held there. And it was woven the curriculum of the entire school system here. So you had all the clubs getting involved. You had the debate club doing skits. You had multiple marching bands with really large sets. You had a field full of young women dancing and costumes galore. Now the costumes were all designed by students and made by home ec. And so I was lucky enough to find three of these dresses in a box. What we're looking at here, those three dresses that are being worn by my friends, those are all late 30s. And so in case you haven't figured out, I'm not a very good wallflower. So I needed something that would stand up to those amazing, gorgeous dresses. I mean, just look at that Aztec-inspired dance outfit. And so even, even right down to the feathers that were worn on the ankles and on the wrist were still in amazing condition. And so I talked to my friend, Glenn, 
So Glenn was a sign designer that rolled in town in the early 50s. And one of the famous signs he did was Mr. Lucky's, which is still standing out on Grand Avenue. And the jacket he did was an homage to the Arizona state flag. And it got me thinking, you know, why just have one suit coat about Arizona themes when I can have many? So I am right now have seven different suit coats all on Arizona themes and working on the next few. Now, one of the reasons I always like to start with this story is because you never know where another story is coming from. And so I did a program for First Filmies of Arizona. And when I was done, a woman tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, let's go out to my car. We went out to her car and she pulled this dress out. This dress was what she, her mother had worn in the mask of the yellow moon. Now she had programs with it that were 28 and 29. I didn't get a chance to mess with them to see exactly what number this was worn in. But, you know, really for being from the late 20s, this dress was in immaculate condition. And if you want more information on First Flames Arizona, you can reach out to them on Facebook or go to their web page. And in order to be a member, you have to have family that were here prior to statehood. So I know I've had a few guests on that were surprised to find out that they could be a member. And it's such a fun group to chat with because they are full of so many stories about Arizona. All right, so it is indeed Arizona History Happy Hour. And so I'm happy to say, let's see if this works. All right, so indeed we do have my bar showing up. And so we have a long list of ingredients for this cocktail, but I'm happy to say for the Sharknado that the Valley Ho has been making the cocktails. This is the first one they've actually pre-batched. And so I am putting them in. So I'm putting some ice there. And the beauty is, oops. I just have to unscrew. I mean, look at how adorable that is. And with a little tag that says Sharknado and everything. All right. And then I just pour it in there. Oh my gosh. And so So this Tiggy Muck is actually from one of our local bars. There are, you have a variety of things like undertow and things like that. But this is from the Bikini Lounge. So now the Bikini actually opened its doors. Oh, and there's, and look at all that's in this amazing cocktail. I mean, who knew that they were making vodka from pineapple. Oh, and that passion fruit really comes out in that. That's tasty and probably a little potent, but that's okay since I'm not going anywhere. So the Kini Lounge opened its doors in the mid fifties. And we think it actually became a, a, a tiki lounge. Then in the early 60s, they went through a big remodel and started touting themselves as a black light Polynesian atmosphere. I would sure love to have seen all the black light Polynesian atmosphere that they had. They still have a lot of the tiki essence, but not as much black light, which would have, which would have been fun to see. And now for show and tell, let's see, let me... All right. All right. So here we have Hidden Harbor in 1955 at the Adams Hotel. Now, the reason why I have this blown up um, piece is because oh, I've done a couple of days of Dave Discovery for the Renaissance Hotel. And so... 
I was hoping that this year we could have done a tiki experience because they have tiki in their history already and it would have been kind of fun. And then I was noticing, since I haven't had a chance to really drink out of this mug yet, that if you look, there we go, there's an X marks the spot. Now they release these on New Year's Eve. And so it has X, X marks the spot 2020. And boy, does it ever. And so there's the old Adams Hotel, as well as what is there now, the Renaissance. And of course, now that thing's put, there we go. And so the Renaissance is on that same plot of land. There have been three hotels starting since the 1895. There has been a hotel on that land. And Hidden Harbor, I fell in love the first time I saw this ad. Let's see if we can, there we go. We can make it nice and big. And so, but then in the early 60s, they moved out to Glendale. Oh, and there's Ernie Minahuna, who we're going to be talking about a little bit later on, if you don't know who he is. So, with the modern technology, oh my gosh, we're going to get ready to have so much fun. Outlaws, Burning Sands, and Legends of Lost Gold. Scottsdale is West is the west most western town. Grab your fire water and saddle up for an adventure through the Southwest Pacific with your storyteller, Tumbleweed Tiki. Hear his tall tales about John Wayne, America's favorite cowboy, and his Hollywood movie premiere at Trader Vic's. Living with Pele in the Valley of the Fire, the desert Polynesian lifestyle, and how Tommy Wong brought Don the Beachcomber to the wild, wild west. yippee ki -yay. And so our guest today is Mike. He lives in Denver, Colorado, where he is a professional engineer, but his passion is researching and sharing Polynesian pop culture stories. He is a Tiki Oasis veteran, having presented popular symposiums, including SeaWorld, San Diego's 1964 exotic masterpiece, Walter Clark and the World of Alaho, Fa Alaho Fashion, and the story of Ahoy, exploring mid-century tiki nautical. All right, so let's bring Mike on. Let's see. Well, hello. Aloha, Marshall. And welcome. And I love your background. Uh, it's my tiki office. Yeah. I can see. Very nice. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. So we're going to have some fun because we've got some great trivia coming up. All about, oh, and we have Gary and Dwayne on the line. All the way from Flagstaff. And you know, and so let's see. Bum, bum, bum. All right. So now let me do this. All right. So there we have. I mean, I love this screen that you made. I mean, how the Pacific, the South Pacific, and the Southwest Pacific look at those mountain ranges, almost identical twins. If you change the color slider bar, you wouldn't know uh, you can switch it from a desert to, uh, to a, a desert island in the South Pacific. It, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's just a, it's a change of color, but it's the same photo. Very cool. So now we're getting ready to do some trivia. And our trivia is a little unique because a lot of places do trivia. And it's more about what you don't know or showing how much you know. And so with this, what we'll do is we go through the questions and then we'll take a little bit and talk about some Arizona music. And then we will go through all the answers and tell the stories of those. All right, so now when, so to keep track, so the beauty of trivia is it's also multiple choice. So even if you don't know the answer, you can take a stab at it and you've got a good shot of getting it right. Now you can keep track either in the chat. Some people also keep track of it 
on a pad next to them. You can do whatever you want. And, but remember at the end, we will go through all of those Tiki answers. All right. So up first, our question, the mashup of Western and Polynesian pop cultures was very common. In 1948, what, culture, what pop culture cowboy took his Wild West roundup to perform in Honolulu, Hawaii? Was it A, Roy Rogers, B, Hopalong Cassidy, C, Clayton Moore, a.k.a. The Lone Ranger, or D, Gene Autry? Which one of those iconic cowboys started with a whole Polynesian cavalcade? in Honolulu. All right, question two. 1959 was the height of popularity of the Western cowboy on TV. The fall lineup included 24 Westerns. That same year, ABC launched a new exotic show to capitalize on Hawaii's new statehood called a, Adventures in Paradise, B, Hawaiian Eye, C, Hawaii Five O, or D, Castaway Cowboy. So which one of those did ABC bring to the airwaves as kind of a counterbalance to all that West, all those Westerns that were on TV? All right, question three. An island of Western hospitality in Arizona. What Phoenix Hotel could you find the Taboo Room Cocktail Lounge and South Pacific Lagoon Swimming Pool? Oh, Swimming Pool, that sounds really good right now. All right, so where could you find the Taboo Room or the South Pacific Lagoon? Was it A, the Contiki? Was it A, Samoan Village? Was it C, Western Village, or D, the Bali High? Which one of those fine establishments could you find those exotic rooms in? All right, question four. In March of 62, Victor Bergeron opened his 12th Trader Vic's Polynesian restaurant in the U.S. It was located where? A, Tucson, B, Mesa, C, Downtown Phoenix, D, Scottsdale. Where was the first, first, where was the 12th Trader Vic's Polynesian restaurant opened up at? All right, and here we are at the halfway point. Scottsdale is known as the westmost Western town and had strict building codes for commercial properties along Fifth Avenue. What did Trader Vic's change to their Polynesian building theme to meet Scottsdale's design code? A, did they change the tiki torches to cowboy bonfires? B, swapped exterior tikis for cactus gardens? C, included murals of cowboys and the Wild West on the building? D, put wagon wheels on the front door? Which one of those did Trader Vic's do to meet the stringent code of Scottsdale? All right, and question six. To celebrate America's bicentennial back in 1976, Trader Vic's created an American Revolution-themed cocktail and debuted it in Scottsdale. It was called A. Paul Revere, B, Yankee Doodle Dandy, C, The British Are Coming, D, One by Land, Two If by Sea. So what did Trader Nick Vix name that cocktail for Bicentennial? On June 7th of 62, Trader Vic Scottsdale hosted a Hollywood red carpet movie premiere party for what John Wayne movie? A, Donovan's Reef, B, The Sea Chase, 
D C wagon train or D Hatari. Which of those movies had their premiere at Trader Vic's in Scottsdale? One of the most elaborate Polynesian restaurants in the Valley of Fire was located at the southeast corner of 7th Street and Camelback in Phoenix. And what was it called? A. The Islands. B. South Pacific. C. Contiki. Or D. None of the above. What do you think that icon it was iconic? People still talk about it. That iconic Polynesian themed restaurant at 7th Street and Camelback, right here in Phoenix. Uh, some of you may have actually even gone there. All right, question nine, we're in the home stretch. Two more questions to go. Polynesian themed housing developments became very popular across the Sun Belt in the early 1960s. Where could you find Polynesian styled living in the Phoenix area? A, Phoenix, B, Peoria, C, Scottsdale, or D, Mesa. Where could you go if you wanted to live the Polynesian lifestyle right here in Arizona? And our last question, number 10. The Polynesian themed housing development of Sands West was built in 1960 by American builder and boasted the zest of metropolitan Phoenix, flavored with the laborious charm of Hawaii. Other advertised benefits included A, living the glamour and romance of fabled Tiki Isles. B, kitchen work done as if by Menahunas due to all the electric living. C, protection from and I have no idea how to kumamuna huna hana 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 hana. <laughs> with, <laughs> with superior air conditioning or D, was it all of the above? I know I'm rooting for A because who doesn't want to live in glamour and romance of fabled tropical isles? All right. So while you're all are kind of tabulating your getting your finalizing your answers, either here in the chat or next to you on a pad of paper, we're going to talk about a Tucson gem, Ernie Menahuna. Now, Ernie was born in the Hawaiian Islands back in the early 20s. He started actually on stage really young, but then he wound up working in the family business for quite some time back in Hawaii but he got restless. So he decided to come to the mainland, spend some time in California before settling right here in the sun of Arizona. He had a variety of bands that he would perform with throughout the area. And then in the 60s, actually started his very own band. Now he performed a lot in Tucson and he actually wound up moving to Tucson and building a whole compound that he liked to call the Menahuna Village that he built with his own two hands. Now, he did a variety of albums. Now, his family, since his death, has actually been turning those into CDs. So even though sometimes you'll get lucky and find one of his records in a thrift store, if you wanted to get more of them, they're actually in the process of very soon. Um, they should be releasing Round the Town, one of his albums. Um, the other one that's still available is Showtime Live at the Spanish Trail. Now, the two prior CDs have been sold out. They don't have any plans to bring those back. But I sure am looking forward to Round the Town coming out. And they said in the next few months, you should be able to pick that up at Zia Records. Uh, and somebody made a comment on how they have a bunch of them that have been signed because he was known if you showed up at one of his shows, wherever he was performing with one of his records, he was more than happy to sign it. 
And so here you have some of the places like the Spanish Trail Inn. He also performed at the Luau right here in Phoenix. And what a fun show I'm sure it was. All right. So now who's ready for some answers? All right. So question one. In 48, what, cult, what pop culture cowboy took his Wild West Roundup to Hawaii? That was Hopalong Cassidy. So this was uh, February 1948. You can see the, uh, the event flyer there in yellow, uh, which ran in the Honolulu Star Advertiser, uh, advertising that Hopalong Cassidy was coming to uh, Honolulu, and he brought his Wild West uh, Polynesian cavalcade. He brought trick riders with him, uh, bull riders. Um, and the Hawaiian cowboy wasn't a concept that was new to, to Hawaii. Uh, they had uh, cowboys on the big island of Hawaii, but this was brought along over there to um, uh, promote the Western United States portion culture of, uh, of, the, of the cowboys. Uh, so they reenacted. It was kind of like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show where they reenacted different uh, scenes uh, throughout the history of the Wild West. Uh, and then you can see the picture there on the left. Um, that's a menu cover. And uh, so this became so popular that that's Roy Rogers restaurant um, with the Tiki God and a cowboy with a lay in front of standing in front of a Tiki God. It's the mashup of those two cultures. Um, and that's Roy and, and Dale Evans um, uh, Western themed resort that they had in Apple Valley, uh, California up there near uh, desert, um, the Death Valley. So it was an interesting mashup. Now, when Hopalong Cassidy made it to uh, Honolulu there, this was 1948. This is a little bit pre-Tiki. Tiki really yeah. didn't started firing on all cylinders till about 1959. That's when Honolulu um, was admitted to uh, statehood. And that's when the Tiki craze really exploded. So this is about a decade in front of that. Uh, but it's interesting to see how um, uh, the Hawaiian Islands embrace this Wild West culture. Wow. All right. In 1959, TV had 24 Westerns, as, as well as then to create an ex exotic show to capitalize on that, ABC launched what? Well, it was this was a trick question because in uh, in 1959, uh, ABC launched two shows. They launched Adventures in Paradise and Hawaiian Eye. Hawaiian Eye was a detective television show based at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Waikiki. Uh, Adventures in Paradise was a little bit different. It was about uh, a, a, a vet from Korea who decides not to go back to the mainland, but instead... Um, uh, skippers this schooner around the south pacific and has a different episode each week this was a counterbalance to what we said uh the 24 westerns in prime time in 1959 you can see chuck connors and rawhide and uh clint eastwood or excuse me uh chuck connors as a rifleman and and uh, clint eastwood and rawhide and then in 1961 just two years later uh the heavy hitter came along and that was bonanza um, and that and that ruled the airwaves as far as the uh, westerns go, and eventually that started to taper down. But Adventures in Paradise ran for four seasons, and um, Hawaiian Eye ran for five seasons. So it was a nice counterbalance at the beginning to to the western culture on television. Now, are either of those Polynesian themed shows are those available? Yes, they're both available on, um, uh, I think there are some homemade DVD collections, but you, you can typically find them at Tiki Oasis events or different Tiki events. People have them for sale in the um, uh, marketplace. I've seen them on um, Etsy and uh, things like that. So they're, they're out there. All right. Very good. All right. An island of Western hospitality in Arizona. What Phoenix hotel could you find? The Taboo Cocktail Lounge and South Pacific Lagoon Swimming Pool. This was the Bally High oh. restaurant. Bally High. <laughs> and I and what's interesting is Bally High. And this was a little another bit of a trick question because the Bally High opened just two months after the Western Village. And they were right next door to each other. And they were literally right across the street from the Bikini Lounge that you referenced earlier, Marshall. So all three of them were kind of in a little triangle right there. Um, I just love this photograph of the Bally High. Um, it's promoting a, an exotic South Seas uh, um, 
motel with uh, Western cowboys in front and uh, promoting the, the Arizona aspect of it. But to your point, when you mentioned earlier about uh, the Bikini Lounge transitioning to a tiki bar in the early 1960s, um, really embracing the blacklight concept inside. Um, I've done a whole nother show specifically on blacklight tiki oh. bars and the history of that. And oh my gosh. there are surprisingly a lot of them. Um, and they were far reaching from Fort Lauderdale to uh, Casper, Wyoming, uh, believe it or not, had a blacklight tiki bar back in the day. Wow. And I mean, and that sign for the belly high is just glorious. Well, the, uh, the Cowboys, what, uh, um, what do they have to do with it? They're representing the Arizona uh, piece of the culture. Now, what's interesting about the taboo room there in the Bally high was that it, they may have uh, served exotic tiki cocktails, but it wasn't tiki decor. It was um, Southeast Asian decor, and it was uh, it was Balinese themed inside. So it was a little bit pre tiki. This is 1955 when it opened, so uh, not quite tiki. But uh, at that time in 1955, uh, Balinese exotic was uh, like stepping through another world uh, when he walked in the front door right next door to the Western Village. And um, and so the Bally High would have been on Grand Avenue um, between 15th and 16th Avenue. And the building is still there. Um, it's now called Teen Challenge. Um, sadly, that sign is long gone, but the building still stands. Um, the pool has been filled in long ago. So there is no more South Pacific Lagoon, sadly. Well, how glorious was the uh, Western Village next door, Marsha? Oh my gosh. I mean, and again, dripping with neon, and it was a Southwest cowboy orgasm, for lack of a better term, because it was oh so kitschy. Mm -hmm. I I wish I really could go there and do some shopping. It was incredible. I can only, I've only seen photos, and not that many, and I wish there were more. Mm -hmm. All right, question four. In March of 62, where did the 12th Trader Vicks open up? That was Scottsdale. So if you're a local, uh, has spent any time in uh, uh, the valley there, uh, there, there's a lot of history and people re fondly remember the Scottsdale. Or the, and it was in two locations there in Scottsdale. The original location was on Fifth Avenue um, in, in the downtown area. And then um, it reopened at the Valley Ho and uh, lasted there for a few years before uh, they closed their doors. But that opened in 1962. And what's interesting about uh, Victor Bergeron and, and his Scots are his Trader Vic's locations. He is he partnered with Hilton Hotels. So almost all of the Trader Vic's across the country, across the world, are built into a ho existing hotel. There are only three of them that actually were standalone locations, and the Scottsdale was one of them. The other two standalone locations were in Vancouver, British Columbia, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. So the Scottsdale was the only store that was standalone in the United States, and and Vic didn't even uh, he didn't even build it. It was a um, a Scottsdale commercial realtor who had a piece of property. She wanted Trader Vic's there, so she actually contacted Trader Vic's and talked them into uh, building a piece of property, and she leased the land back to them uh, because she wanted a Trader Vic's in in uh, downtown Scottsdale. So if you go there today, the building still stands. It's been a bit um, kind of chopped on a little bit. Um, the Citizen Public House is the restaurant that's now located in that location in the same building. It's a little oh. heartbreaking to see it today. It is. Um, and I guess I've not been up. They still have kind of the crow's nest that they use for special events. I don't know. Mm. And I don't know how. I've not been up into that to see how bad it's been remodeled or, but yeah, I mean, the peaks are gone off the roof and yeah. All right. So how did Trader Vic's meets the stringent requirements of Scottsdale because they wanted so much Southwest to be influenced in every building? Absolutely. And they had to make a concession here. And this was the only VIX that had this, uh, but they put murals on the exterior of the building. Now, what's unusual about this, if you look, uh, just take a, a passing, uh, passing, glancing look, 
it just looks like some maybe some Hawaiian glyphs or so there. But if you look closely, those are cowboys and Indians, um, stagecoaches and bison, and and those are it's telling a Wild West story. Every other Trader Vic's location around the world, um, those glyphs like that were Hawaiian, and they told the story of Polynesia. And uh, so that's what they did to placate uh, the planning commission there in Scottsdale, and they let them do that, um, include the tiki torches out front and the sweeping A-frame design, as long as they put a Poly or a Western mural on the front, and then you can see those that stylized desert art down below with the scorpion um, and the quail and the rattlesnake um, instead of a surfer and a volcano and a coconut palm. The other thing, the picture that we have there of the tiki wearing a cowboy hat uh, riding a, a horse, uh, that came off of a scarf that was that was sold in the gift shop oh there in, in the Scottsdale location. And uh, Trader Vic, Victor Bergeron, his um, stepdaughter from his second marriage, she was an artist who ultimately relocated to uh, Sedona um, and became a wildlife artist. But that's her artwork. And, uh, and Vic liked it and said, let's uh, put a tiki on a horse and we'll sell it in Scottsdale. So you could buy this as a as a as a neck scarf, and it had several different vignettes of uh, doing tiki's doing cattle roundups or branding cattle and doing different things. But uh, uh, what a what a crazy look! And this was only available there in Arizona. You couldn't buy it at any of the other locations. Wow. You know, in all my years of dealing vintage and having friends, we've never run across one of those scarves. They must be highly treasured. I, I've only seen pictures of, I, I know of two people in the Tika community who have, a, who have that. And uh, that's the only time I've ever uh, known that or stumbled across it. So they're very rare. Wow. All right. So how are y'all doing so far as we keep moving on to question six? All right. So Trader Vix developed a special Bicentennial 1976 cocktail. And it was rolled out right here in Scottsdale. What was it called? It was marketed as the Paul Revere, a revolutionary cocktail. And uh, they made a big special deal about that, that it was premiered here in Scottsdale. And the mayor of Phoenix and the mayor of um, Scottsdale were invited to the premiere party on uh, just a couple of days before New Year's uh, 1975 to um, uh, welcome the bicentennial. And if you notice, look at the, uh, the ingredients there. It's got New England rum. Uh, Jamaican rum, cherry brandy, and um, oh, I can't read the last part. Of it. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Or Oh, oh um, and so the uh, um, the rums, the New England rum, and the and the Jamaican rum were there to um, uh, reference the the Glockchester fishermen from the East Coast, and they would travel down to uh, Jamaica and bring back the rum. And the cherry brandy is there for reference to uh, George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. Um, and the reference. Now, you, there's this picture I took out of the uh, out of the Arizona newspaper. There, it was served in a mason jar with a little American flag there uh, that said "Don't tread on me." And uh, it was also only available uh, in that ma mason jar that said Trader Vic's Scottsdale with the Paul Revere logo on the other side. So uh, maybe someday you may uh, keep your eyes open. You might find one of those in a thrift store um, yeah. in Arizona there. Now, they asked uh, the manager of uh, Trader Vic's at this premiere party, um, what does that mean, uh, one if by land, two if by sea? And the manager responded, it doesn't matter if you have two, you'll forget all about it. So they really embraced <laughs> this in 1976, especially in, in this store. You know, one of the things that Trader Vic's was known for was their Chinese ovens, where they would smoke their meats and their duck um, uh, picking duck when they would serve that. Um, and they really got in the spirit. And for 1976, they repainted their uh, barbecue ovens in the back, uh, red, white, and blue with stars and stripes all the way around them. Uh, so they were, they really embraced this there in, for that uh, one year in 76. Wow. So, and I, I think that Paul Revere, uh, everything that I've uh, researched about it, I think this cocktail was exclusive to Scottsdale. I didn't find it or f read anything about any of the other Trader Vic's locations um, serving this at, uh, during the Bicentennial. Oh, wow. So it was another piece of unique. So not only did you have the cocktail that was unique, but you had the cowboy scarf that was unique to Scottsdale. All right, so June 7th of 62, Trader Vic's hosted 
a movie premiere for John Wayne's movie? Atari. This was, um, if you have never seen this movie, um, go put it in your Netflix queue and watch it. It's a fun movie. It's Howard Hawks uh, directed it, and uh, it was filmed all on location in, in Africa. And the concept of it is a little dated at this point uh, where they're going through and they're, they're doing live capture for animals to, to sell to zoos and things like that. Uh, but if we put it in context of when it was produced in 1962, uh, you know, that was appropriate for, for the time. But they wanted uh, the, the ladies auxiliary at this time was um, the Phoenix Zoo was uh, had, was just going through the opening process. They were trying to raise some funds. So the women's auxiliary reached out to Hollywood and asked if they could host this premiere, uh, the Atari premiere in Scottsdale and raised and all the money raised and generated from the party, excuse me, would be donated back to the zoo. So it was a fundraiser. And so uh, uh, Paramount Pictures uh, was all about, and there's a picture of the Duke um, in Trader Vic's and you can see on the uh, table behind him, there's a whole bunch of planners punch um, in those bamboo stock cocktail uh, things. And there's some earlier pictures I've showed in other shows where the Duke's wearing a lay uh, and he's got a Polynesian cocktail in his hand. Uh, eventually he, he takes the lay off and switches back over to his uh, cigarettes. And Duke was known for smoking multiple packs of cigarettes a day. He was a heavy, heavy smoker, but it was fascinating because they, so they hosted the Hollywood premiere there in Vix, um, and then you, they walked down Fifth Avenue to the Kachina Theater down around the corner where they premiered the movie. And um, one oh. of the animals that they sh that they used during the filming was a cheetah, um, and the cheetah's name was Sonia. And they actually flew the cheetah out, and it traveled with uh, with uh, with the Duke. And so before the movie started in the Kachina Theater, uh, the Duke was up on stage. Uh, you know, addressing the audience and he had the cheetah with him. Um, so they were really playing up the, the wildlife aspect of it. And then they showed the movie. Um, it's, it's a really fun movie. And um, what's interesting about this, as soon as Duke finished filming or this premiere, the next day he got in an airplane and flew to Kauai um, and began, began filming Donovan's Reef with um, uh, and spent, spent time there in Hawaii, he went straight from Africa to feet to Scottsdale to um, to uh, Hawaii to start filming his next movie. He was a busy man. Wow. I mean, that would have been such a fun night to be hanging out at Trader Vic's as well as Kachina Theater. Mm -hmm. Ah, all right. One of the most elaborate Polynesian restaurants here in the Valley of Fire was at 7th Street in Camelback. And it was called... The Islands, and this is another one of those um, restaurants that has a lot of uh, local fond memories, uh, and you you can probably speak to that, Marshall. Uh, what what do you hear when people come up and talk to you, and do they uh, uh, wax poetic about the islands? Oh my gosh! I mean, almost to the point of you can see their eyes tearing up because it was such a fun place. So many amazing memories of birthdays celebrated. Um, I know so many folks who have a tiki mug from the islands. Mm -hmm. Well, they had several different uh, uh, themed rooms in there. They had a waterfall room and a tiki room and a tapa bar and a cannibal room. And so the, the islands has an interesting history. We won't go too much into it. Uh, but when it opened uh, early in 1958, it went through some ownership. And then in 1976, it went through an ownership change. Um, and Tommy Wong purchased uh, the building. And Tommy uh, got his, um, he was from China and he was a chef. He wasn't a, a mixologist or a barman. Uh, but he got his. He started his career in uh, in Don at Don the Beachcomber in Chicago, and he kind of followed Don around through some of his different locations. So Tommy Wong started in Chicago at Don the Beachcomber, then he went to the Aku Aku in uh, Las Vegas, then ultimately he ended up at the Cone Tiki in Tucson, and then he moved up here to the island. So Tommy brought quite a pedigree of previous Polynesian restaurants. So when he got to the islands, he bought it in 1976. He ran it for a couple of years, then he sold it to Del Webb, and then he bought it back, and there was a, a lot of transitions there. But ultimately, Tommy retired here to Denver, where I live, and he opened up another um, 
I, a restaurant based on this location, the islands. And here he called his restaurant Tommy Wong's Island. Um, and it was kind of his grand dame and his, his swan song to Polynesian restaurants when he retired. Several years ago, uh, a friend of mine here in Denver ran into uh, Tommy's daughter selling some stuff out at a swap meet. And we invited Tommy, who was still alive at the time, uh, to come over to my basement tiki bar. And I did a full hour-long presentation about Tommy Wong's history and oh. about all the restaurants that he had worked in. And he was right there with us. And it was it was tough to get through the show because every show, every picture that would come up, he would tell us a story about it. And so oh it, it, we just went on and on and on about it. And when we were done, we recorded the whole thing. So we, uh, we documented the history. But when we were done, uh, Tommy's uh, daughter came over to me with a tear in her eye and she said, I've never seen my dad this happy. And um, to recognize that something he did 35 years ago, uh, people are still enjoying this today. So it, that was a lot of fun, but Tommy had his fingers involved here at, at one point uh, for a couple of years before he sold it back to Del Webb uh, at the islands. So there's a lot of history there at that restaurant in Phoenix. Yeah. I mean, and still, I mean, people still have so many amazing stories. I've got one, um, guy who hit me up, his dad had been a bartender there, um, probably under Tommy Wong's time, it sounded like in the early 70s. So, yeah, I mean, that's a place I would love to get more stories and would love to find more photos. Mm -hmm. So just a hint, if everyone out there has photos sitting in a photo album, <laughs> I would love to see them. I'm sure Mike would as well. That's one of the, we're always looking, aren't we, Marshall? <laughs> always looking for those private photos because they will be more telling than yeah. the professional photos where everything was all gussied up and only were the, the glamour shots right. as opposed to inside scenes. And so, yeah. All right. Question nine. So Polynesian themed housing. You can find it all of the above. You can find it <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you can find it everywhere now in the world of tiki uh there are there are people that are into it for the vintage fashion there are people that are into it for the music some people are into it for the art or the cocktails uh, i'm into it to the history and specifically the architecture history that's what really excites me and the uh, you know the exotic the transport uh when you walk into one of these buildings and tiki apartments and tiki themed housing developments just kind of blow my mind because you can find them literally coast to coast and it's not just California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida, but you could find them in Indiana. You could find them in Billings, Montana. You could find them in Boise, Idaho. You found them in Denver, Colorado. They were literally everywhere. And so right there in, in uh, Arizona, you had uh, Phoenix, had the Sands Oasis and the Sands West developments, uh, the Polynesian Village mobile home, which we see the picture here. I took this picture in 2009, which was still in pretty good shape over there in Peoria. Uh, Scottsdale has their uh, Polynesian Paradise uh, right. condo complex. Uh, and then in Mesa is probably one of the most beautiful locations. Uh, and it, it's there's only a couple, uh, but the Apache Estates um, residential development there is probably the marquee uh, tiki residential home uh, that was built in the Apache Estates. And the other interesting thing when we get back to the mashup of tiki and cowboy culture is that the tiki house is at one end of the street and at the far end of the cul-de-sac is Lauren Green's house from Bonanza. And it was the recreation of the Ponderosa house, which I'm sure you can elaborate a little bit on that, Marshall. That also has some fond memories. Uh, people kind of wax poetic about that. Well, and it's funny because when you talk about those 24 shows that were on TV, the four that you showed all had filming that was done right here in Arizona. Hmm. In fact, a lot of it was done right here in the Valley. So, I mean, it's like when you start talking about just that pop culture of Arizona, it really was that Western. And I love hearing about this new, this concept of the collision of then the whole Polynesian mashup. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because they were both popular on television uh, and pop culture, backyard luau's at the same time as Tommy was having uh, uh, his six shooter uh, guns from uh, Roy Rogers. They were both popular at the same time. Mom and dad are enjoying a, a cocktail in the backyard while, while uh, uh, they're playing Cowboys and in Indians. Also, that's why I think there's so much crossover. They were just, they were both immensely popular uh, both th through that same time period. Yeah. And I know, um, and Lauren Green's house sold and was supposed to become a museum, but I don't think that ever happened. So I don't know quite what, what's the story about it now, hmm. if that's still kind of in the works or not. 
All right. And so the Polynesian themed housing development of Sands West built in the sixties had the charm and touted so many benefits of living at the Sands West. All of the above, but I would like to hear you pronounce the uh, God of air conditioning again on answer C. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kumu Mohanahana. Uh, and that, that, it's just a made up, it's just a made up name. Somebody in their marketing department put it together. Uh, it has no basis in, in anything. Um, but um, funny, funny story how I discovered the Sands West development. Um, at the time I was 2008, 2010, I was working in Phoenix and I, and I ran into Dewey Webb and we ended up having some cocktails at, um, uh, at Trader Vic's when they were at the Valley Ho. And one, one of the weeks uh, he, he brought back, he, he had grown up as a kid in the Sands West development and he had saved the original housing brochure uh, wow. from, the, from the housing development. He brought it and he gave it to me and he said, I think you'll appreciate this more than I will. I've had it for decades. Um, so I'll, I'm entrusting you with it now. And it had the names and the marketing brochures and the glossy pictures um, and the models and all the models. You could buy the Samoan house or the Fijian house or the Hawaiian oh. estate house. Uh, so all the models were Polynesian themed. But my favorite part of that whole brochure was that um, uh, through the through the um, quality of electric living that you could combat uh, the tiki god of heat and air conditioning, Kumu Hanahana. And uh, <laughs> I, I've never seen that before. And it's it's only it's only there in uh, Arizona. But uh, and the other piece I think that's from from a marketing aspect, uh, their marketing to the housewives at the time was uh, all of the electric appliances available in the kitchen uh, to make your uh, you know dinner and meal preparation so easy, almost as if done by the Menahunis. And for those of people who don't know what a Menahuni is, uh, that's the Hawaiian version of a leprechaun, uh, the little magical people that uh, um, in, in folklore that would work overnight and have things done. You'd wake up in the morning and, and your chores would be done for you. So uh, they were marketing that menahunis were available and uh, would help you with your kitchen uh, and meal preparation. So are there any, any of the housing left for the Sands West? In the Sands West, it's um, you can see the bones and the framework. Of, it's kind of like what you talked about when you moved into your home. It needed some TLC. Uh, okay. the, bone, the bones are there, but they, nobody that's living in these two neighborhoods, Sands Oasis or Sands West, uh, appreciates them like you and I would as a tiki home. So uh, we need somebody to live over, move over there and, and spruce it up. But they, they need some TLC, that's for sure. And where was the Sands West? Uh, it's up there off of... Um, um, it's a North central Phoenix. Um, the shoot, the, the, the street name escapes me. I'll, I might remember it here in a minute, but, um, it's North, North central Phoenix. Well, you know, and thank you so much for bringing up Dewey Webb's name. Oh my gosh. I mean, what a treasure. I'm so glad a lot of, he was a lot of fun and we just, I just randomly bumped into him. Um, and we started talking Tiki and he just kept talking Tiki or talking Tiki and, and, and we just uh, went back and forth. And, um, at that time I was traveling back and forth between Denver and Phoenix every week for work. And so we kind of had a standing, uh, you know, time to meet for a cocktail every Monday night, we would meet at Trader Vic's, have a couple of cocktails. Um, and he, we'd share some more stories about Phoenix and, and Tiki. And, and then one of those weeks is when he brought the brochure. So that was a lot of fun. Wow. That would have been great. So, yeah. So Mike, thank you so much. And as, and as a Hawaiian would say, Aloha partners. Aloha y'all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you, Marshall. I had a great time. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Oh my gosh. You know, that's the beauty of these shows is it's, it's always a learn. It's always never just a one-sided learning experience. It's always this give and take. And then also I know um, I actually saw some live feeds earlier from San Diego where they're going to have virtual Tiki Oasis. So if you're interested, you can log on to TikiOasis.com and see what all they have going on in the next couple of days. If you'd like to dress up in your caftan, or your moo moo and sit and watch some TV and watch some Tiki in front of you. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
Well, and we're also hopeful that uh, Arizona Tiki Oasis, which was delayed from uh, uh, in April of earlier this year, it's been postponed till October over the Halloween. Um, there's been no no update, of, so we don't know what the status of that is yet, but I've been asked to, to do another presentation there uh, over Halloween, and that's going to be uh, an exploration of the mashup of the Tiki culture and the Disney culture um, oh. and how those two worlds intersect. And one of the most fun things that I discovered was um, a, so a lost theme park that was designed by Disney Imagineer Raleigh Crump who designed the Haunted Mansion and Small World and the, uh, some of the tikis at the at the tiki room, uh, Rolly designed a Hawaiian Disneyland. Uh, it wasn't for Disney. It was for a different developer. Um, and I've since discovered some of the concept artwork and I'm putting the stories together. Uh, so I'll share that artwork and share those stories uh, at our next Tiki Oasis. And you can hear the story about Kahe Point, which was the lost Hawaiian Disneyland. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And much more beyond just a small world of children and <laughs> and grass skirts dancing. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for having me, Marshall. It was great. Oh it was a lot of fun. Thank you. thank you so much and have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Oh my gosh. You know, this is always so much fun because there's always more to learn. There are so many stories out. So, so again, a big round of applause for Mike because that was so much fun and learn so much about places I already thought I knew about. That's, ah. Uh. All right, so our final segment is called Little Arizona. And so I was able to find a little town called Antares, which is up in Mojave County. It has a population of about 126 people and it's right on historic route 66. Now, Antares is named that, and here you can see a, <laughs> all the mailboxes for all the residents on the, on the other side of the street, so they can all get that. Now, Antares gets its name from the star Antares, which is in the Scorpio constellation, and is also the Greek word that means rival of Mars, because it was, it's known for all these red rocks, these red boulders. Now, Antares has over 6,000 mine claims in and around it. Most of them are closed. There are a f about 200 in the area which are still kind of usable and still used. Primarily there they dug for copper, gold, lead, and silver. Now, it also began, the town kind of got its foundation back as a connecting line for railroad tracks um, back in 1883. Now, also local legend talks about how, oh, and also it's famous for Giganticus Hedicus, which was done by an artist back in 2003 as a way to highlight kind of the trailer park, the hotel and the Antares Cozy Trailer Park or the Ranchero Hotel. Now, it's also said that Gene Rodberry stayed here at the Ranchero Hotel, and that's where he got the name Antares for one of the spaceships used in Star Trek. So I love how one little town of a hundred and some people can bring in Tiki culture, Star Trek culture, kind of rancho, <laughs> Southwest culture, um, and trailer parks all in one fail swoop and a little tiny town. So also remember, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or ideas, please reach out to me. Here's how you can reach out via either Facebook. You can hit me up on Instagram or even email. Now, also remember, there are there is my Venvo up at the top of the screen. So if you'd like to make a donation, any amount is very much appreciated because that's what keeps this show going. Next week, we have the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office. Now, it's also that week is Catherine Leonard's birthday. So it's going to be her birthday episode. So I know she's going to be inviting her friends. I'm intrigued to see what 
PJ is going to cook up again as a cocktail for us all to enjoy. And also on Saturday, doing a presentation called That's Entertainment, Arizona's LGBTQ History. So that's a lot of fun. Still adding more names to that list. I keep finding more amazing folks to put on it. As well as October is right around the corner and trying to look and see how I can kind of do, you know, because normally what I would do in October is I would have bus tours. That's not going to happen. So it's going to be some sort of a virtual tour. So looking forward to rolling that out. Still figuring out what that's going to look like. Also, very special thanks to Cole Travis and Chris Allen. Cole did the music for the intro video, as well as my friend Chris did the video. And then we have PJ Vader Baron, who is probably not joining us, but he's probably watching Shark Week right now because he's a little bit obsessed with it. As well as then our outro music is done by Mr. Ho. Orchestratica. I know they have an event coming up tomorrow night. So if you Google Mr. Ho Orchestratica, you can track them down and find they are doing a live feed tomorrow that will be a lot of fun as well. So again, I want to thank you all for being here. This wouldn't happen without you and your support, as well as support of AARP Arizona. And they always say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. ARP is here in, fee in Arizona, providing information that can help you and your family. If you'd like to find out more about them and what they are doing in this moment or in this crisis, you can take a look at their website, www.arp.org slash AZ. And again, there is the information so you can reach out to me. Again, I want to thank you all so much for being here and have a great rest of your night as we get ready for some Mr. Ho and some found film footage.